Um, so, tonight we're going to have an open discussion. What you guys are doing, what you're looking at, what you're trying to accomplish, questions like what on earth is big data, how would you personally define it, how would any one of us define it, um, and have it so that it's a conversation that hopefully benefits each one of us. It's not going to be easy because we all come from different perspectives, different uh, sections of our life. We're all looking at different things, right? The only way it's going to be possible is if a few of us, hopefully all of us, or close to it, um, actually participate. Start asking questions, talk about what you've done, talk about um, maybe different practices that you've seen. We'll have Matt Davies and Pat Ride and others that have, have been doing this for a little while now talk a little bit about what they would consider some of the architectures that are out there, some of the best practices, etc. But it's open for all of us. It doesn't have to go in order. We're not necessarily looking for somebody to come up and present and spend 20, 30 minutes talking about whatever. Rather, let's ask some questions and figure out what's going on. And then at some point, whether it happens naturally or not, I'd like to also frame this conversation a little bit around the air quality piece as well. Right? Um, because we've had many people, maybe myself included, maybe Pat included, maybe all of us, at some point have thought, shouldn't we have a little bit more direction on this? You know, we've got all these huge data sets, we've got all these disparate sources, we have all these things that we could potentially tackle within the realm of air quality with these tools, but if we don't necessarily know what paths we're going down, then where do we get started, right? We've resisted up to this point saying, go out and start setting up a Hadoop cluster, uh, you're going to need to stick within Pig and Hive, you can't use any other tools, because we don't want to limit who's involved, we don't want to limit uh, creativity. And Hadoop and Pig and Hive and those specific tools or other specific tools are not going to cover every problem that we can potentially tackle. Right? Nor are we all necessarily going to think of every problem that we can tackle. So we all need to come up with different approaches. We're going to ask community, possibly like DEQ, DAQ, maybe just community in general to provide us some questions so that we can go find some answers to. Hopefully they'll help us kind of uncover some holy grails, or maybe the holy grail of air quality. What is this? What's wrong? Whatever it is, right? Um, and then we can go and start working towards those things as teams. Next week, on Wednesday, um, the organizers of the pseudo company, which you haven't heard about, I don't think, um, are going to get together a little bit to talk more about architecture and direction and best practices and where what are some of the things that we want to get to as end goals. But we're still going to keep those fairly loose because as teams you should have the ability to say, you know what, I really want to look at just vegetation and how that relates to air quality. I think that's an interesting problem, it may not be something that a team decides to focus on, but either way, it's out there, right? But again, we all need to be involved. So before Pat goes, Maybe we can all do a quick introduction to say who you are, say why you're here tonight, and what kind of things you have interest in. And then we can kind of hopefully build it out from there a little bit. I'm Nick Bagley, by the way. Big interest in big data in Utah Hadoop Users Group. Um, been running it for several years now and with founded it with Matt years ago and we put on several things now and really want to see something great come out of this air quality competition because I have an end goal, and I think a lot of us have that now, of making Utah the big data hub, a central place worldwide, so that when people talk about big data, they talk about Utah as well. You want to go ahead? Sure. Uh, my name is Dan Fellers. Um, I have a background in software development and, and been working on a startup, um, but I also work in the venture capital world. And so I work with a late stage VC firm that is looking heavily into some very well known um, big data companies. And so I uh, just want to get more familiar. I've, I, I haven't done a lot of deep, true big data stuff, but definitely done a lot of data heavy 
um, software development, and it's the uh, first time here. Very cool. We may be late stage, but just so you know, at the end, we're going to try and have a mixer for VCs and for other companies so that they can see some of the ideas here and say, hey, that's actually a good idea. Maybe we should put some light. Matt? OK. Matt Davies. Uh, so I am a software architect. been doing big data since uh, 2009. Uh, variety of settings, healthcare, finance, uh, retail, and uh, I guess security would be another one. Um, so everything related to Hadoop, that's kind of been my belly whip for uh, several years now. I'm Tyler Reichel, a developer and financial company called Linkedin. And you can kind of learn about you know, what, what people are using for as far as smell instrument data and you know, just kind of figure out best practices. My name is Alan, I also work at Lendio. I just think big data is very important, I'm kind of a big data new, but I want to get into it because I think it's an important part of getting to know the software that you're doing. Big data, big data that doesn't fit well in rows and columns of ecosystem tools. And so um, I also work for MarkLogic, which is a uh, NoSQL database, not to know you And so, um, yeah, I can participate a little more about the uh, ecosystem and uh, contribute what I might experience. Hi, Sean Siemens, the lead at Overstock. I'm uh, just interested in big data. We'll move me to data and data analysis, but uh, just interested in it. Uh, my name is Tree. Um, this is just the data that I'm that I'm experiencing. Um, I work at a bank uh, in my work. Let's go to the I'm Vince Bushnell. I work for SuperValue. I'm a, a data warehouse guy getting into the big data arena. <laughs> Kind of the most 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 of the so we, we started out with about 700 a year ago. And it's so, um, so, <laughs> so um, I kind of focus on big data for healthcare, and I'm doing some work with Intermountain with their big data efforts there. Um, but have connections to, we do a lot of, at CSC, we do a lot of work in the projects, communities, and a lot of other industries. My name is Chris Seavey. I work in the financial industry. I, I studied a little bit of computer science in college and uh, I'm just I'm here to learn some more. Uh, I'm Zay Yerbro. I'm a sophomore in college. I'm doing a computer science degree. Just came in the lab to check it uh, I'm Chuck Yarborough, and uh, I came for the pizza and the water. Um, now, I, I'm a data guy. Uh, I've spent time uh, consulting and actually doing real life data warehousing. Um, and I've spent time at uh, a company called Hyperion, Information Builders, SAP, Business Objects. I'm now with a small big data analytics company on San But I live in the area, and um, thought I'd like to find out what's going on in our local. Glad to meet you. Thanks. My name is Elena. I'm a Oracle DB developer. I'm a user in Big Data. My name is Ray. I'm a new to the area, but very deeply interested in data analysis and data modeling. I'm a new to the area. 
So this happens to be a strong interest of the yeah. My name is Kiran, and uh, I have worked in uh, the data analyst for the company here, the medical health company. And uh, I did always I see work and table power and other clear interest in the company. Yeah, I'm here. So, I'm with Ben here. Uh, I've been in the data warehouse uh, at Intermount for the last 15 years. And whether it's relation data, working on that machine, we're trying to understand how we can look at data concepts and look at all the data we have in the mouth. Are there any secrets coming back from the Okay, so you're in the on things to educate everyone from, uh, I don't know, elementary on up, what big data is, what actually what software development is, and so I'd love to get all the universities involved. It's all ready to go. 
We're going to start working on some resources for you to do this too as well. But keep these things in mind. So, big thing to utah.org is the website you want to go to. Okay, and that's kind of the first menu page. Facebook Twitter right now is going to change probably in the next few days. Matt and I are working on some changes. There's some things that are going to change, but there will be some key things that you always want to have here. The quick links right over here. This lists, lists the data sets we already have. When we created a Jira system, I open this up. We created a Jira account basically to create all these data sets. So all the data sets we have right now are in as Jira tickets that you can go and look at. They have the URL in there, and they say, OK, we go out here to this URL and pick up the data. Now, the data is not sitting here for you. That's the whole point of this operation. It's not ready to go. You have to go out to the website and you have to collect it. That's the whole point. Once you collect it, once it's clean, then you submit it back to the open certificate itself. Okay? That way, we're all going to do this now. Somebody may say, well, what if I do it? What if the guy next to me does it too? Well, that's OK. This is a learning process. We want multiple people to do this. Think of it just like a distributed system. We would love to have three replicas of each one of these. That would be wonderful. I would love to have this. This is why, when it comes back, though, you must submit it to me so I can take care of the communication process to make sure we don't put up three of the same stuff. Okay? So, um, play around that. This is the link right here to the current data sets in Jira. You may have to create a Jira account. If you want to comment, if you want to talk, it's a free account. It's set up with Jira. It's all taken care of. Right? Um, the next thing that we can work with to remember about, the Google Plus account, you should follow that account so that you see all these announcements of these hangouts. If you just want to go look at the um, hangouts, you can go right here. YouTube channel, and there's all the listed videos we've already done. Now, you'll see other things right in here, too. SLC SQL user group name. Utah Geek Events does a lot more things besides just this competition, but it's all going to be helpful data in the technical community. So basically, anything we record as Utah Geek Events will show up on campus, whether that's a SQL users group, whether that's an Oracle users group in the future, whether that's something else, it'll be up in the end. And that's beneficial to you because you may need that technology for something else. Okay. So, but you'll see all of them will be named air quality. So be able to find them. Uh, this one's live now, right there. Uh, air quality, you know, it's pretty easy to see. Okay. So the things you can do right now, you can go out to the general list. You can start pulling data sets. The MesOS data set is basically all that. It's I think positive. Yeah. No, it's fine. Yeah, it's it's compressed. It's not terrible. <laughs> so, it's not my parents. Um, so there's a link there. You can go directly and get that file. And that file right there, I think, has four or five years already ready to go, kind of where you can start analyzing and looking at it right now. Um, we're about to turn on there's a traffic data one coming that will be um, put in probably in the next year or two. And then there's a few other ones that are working on right now that get submitted as well. Um, somebody mentioned Arden from BYU. If you have a submission that you'd like to add, the new founder data set, I thank you very much for it. You can, you can use this form here, and you can tell me what you want me to look at. I'm going to take that form, and I'm going to put it into Jira tape. Again, why take the two-step process? Because I don't want to do this. The list of these actually already have new ones. We both have the same URLs. I, I want to put a lot of duplicates in there, so I will get this email, and then I will put it into the Jira system so that somebody can go and take it back. Okay? All right. And then what other questions do we have? The newsletter, yes, thank you for reminding me. Right at the bottom, the most important thing you can do, if you really want to be part of the competition, if you want to help out, if you want to participate, you must sign up for that newsletter. That is essentially our kind of our registration list of who's registered for the competition. That newsletter only goes out about once a week. I don't spam anybody. I'll send out one or two many tops to remind you of events like this and tell you what's coming up for the week. I'll also send out a lot of reminders about here's links to last week, here's links to other videos, here's things you can do. Okay? But you want to sign up for that newsletter, or else, you know, we don't know the terms of working. Yes? Uh, so I was wondering if you move the mic a little bit closer. Apparently, the, the fans producing a lot of. So closer to me. Closer to you. Okay. Well, I'll move it back later. I really don't like that projector. <laughs> okay. Well, hopefully, when you go back to hear the recording, it's not too bad. 
So make sure you sign up for the mailing list right there, okay? Real simple. It's a MailChimp mailing list. We're not selling it or anything. It's just a simple mailing list. We're the only ones that do anything with it, all right? Uh, other things. Um, calendar. We keep our calendar down here. We run a lot of these through Meetup so that they're, so you can sign up through Meetup. Now, when you sign up for Meetup, you know, you see these calendar items and everything great, but you're not going to get the newsletter unless you actually go to the site and sign up for the newsletter. We can't get that off of Meetup, so we need the newsletter for people to actually sign up and participate. All right, other questions? Yes, sir. So you mentioned submitting the actual data. How do we do that in what format? OK, so if the question was, how do we submit the actual data once it's clean and ready to go? The first thing you're going to do is come back to the site, and at the bottom, there's another form. Uh, did I put the form on the site? Yes, you'll send this right here, okay? And this will tell me the title, the description, kind of where it's sitting. If it's local on your computer and it's not at a URL or anything, tell me that too, that's fine. But in other words, this is the same idea. So that people can submit multiples, it's going to send to me and it's going to say, I have this data set ready. I'm going to contact you and then we're going to work out how to get it up on the civic data site. The civic data site is right here. I have a couple of these open, I think. It's right here. So someone can go on there and create their own account and actually upload it, but we really ask that you don't because we want to make sure we don't send up three of the same things up there. Okay. As for format, I don't care. <laughs> um, part of the whole competition, part of the whole cooperation is that when you do your day job with data, who gets data perfectly formatted every single time when they're doing a project? No one. So we want it as clean as possible, but if you say this is an XML file, well then we're going to have to work with an XML file. Or if you say this is a CSV file, we're going to have to work with a CSV file. If you said this is a bunch of JSON objects, we're going to have to work with that. So think about yourself. What would you want it to be when you started to analyze the data in the competition aspect? That's what you want to do. You don't want to make it hard because you're going to have to use this data as well, and all of, everybody else is going to have to use it. But you don't want to make it. You don't want to spend 300 hours trying to get it to the perfect, absolute 100% format. You want to get it as close as possible so that you can keep working on other things. Did that make sense and answer your question? Sure. It does seem as though you can nicely go and converge on some common data set for formats or formats. So the common thing that every file, every data set must have is location and time, essentially. Those are the two things that every piece is really going to have to have. Yeah, unfortunately, the structural thing is going to be a little harder to do. There's a lot of different people, a lot of different systems are going to be doing this. So we can't enforce it. We would love to see everybody say, every set we send up is a CSV, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but again, think of it yourself. The goal with this site is that when it comes down to it, when it comes to competition time, you're coming here, you're getting the data, and you're competing on it. So however much time that takes you, that's going to be the difference. Yes? So, you know, the, the two quick questions that I have is, you know, if you're looking at the information thing, and fully fleshed out, it would be, you know, 150 columns and tens of millions of rows. Okay. It would seem to me that there's subjects in there that would be valuable that break out for something that, that is valuable for money. It seems to me there's some intelligence you can lay on it that makes it more valuable to the consumer. Uh, okay, so like you know, there's ten, there's ten different handy temperatures in there. So so we need to say somehow this is the ambient temperature at this station. Um, and <laughs> you have some kind of you know there there's added for anybody to come. So the question is, is but okay. So one one part of that question is, is, if I got this correct, you don't want to see one giant file up there. You see that it won't work as one giant file essentially. Right. Okay. So first thing, it should not be one giant file. It should definitely be broken into pieces of different things that you want to do. Things that we've been considering about as categories like health, air, weather, um, transportation. Different pieces have different things. 
So you should have different data sets for each piece. You should have different files. The second part to that question is, how do I know which ambient temperature, how, how do I know which measurement in the file I should use? Your best suggestion there is firing off an email into the Google group that we can have Matt Lammers or someone else that is a technology expert or an air quality expert give us that answer and say, you need to use this one. He talked about it a little bit last week, if you go back and watch that. So um, he can kind of give us the idea that I would suggest you use this temperature for these things. Yes, Matt. I've been a big proponent of not eliminating data for the simple reason of if you eliminate data, you've already skewed the questions you're going to ask. And everyone's going to come at this with a slightly different perspective. And if one person's opinion is valuable, other people will come up and say, uh, no, it's not valuable, or you know, I really needed that. So my, my perspective and my, my suggestion is clean the data, try and make it parse some parser, define it, so give it a schema, and then we just upload it. And then whoever's doing, using it can use it, whether you're using R, Hadoop, Cassandra, or whatever. But let the decision be the last minute, not made early. I think that's a key point, because if you're talking about a large file, or one of the files that has a lot of columns, you could definitely pull down that file and then remove some of those columns you don't need through that process and say, I just want this one. When you made the decision to do that, that's where the intelligence comes in because you're not cutting someone off, else off that said, no, I want to use this one. So, yeah, I, I, I agree yeah. with that. You know, in this early stage, if I'm sure it might make it a robust, that it makes sense. You know, I'll probably do the whole 150 columns. Right. Make it as robust as I can and then deliver it as, as a, you know, maybe just one or two of those data so people yeah, definitely. We just see that mapping and cutting down phase as could be part of the competition. And, and yeah, the yeah. Competition our, our ultimate goal is to overload this website with data. And they've told me that I can't do that, but I'm going to try and challenge them. And my goal is to make sure that there's so much data up there they have a hard time handling it. And that when we pull it back down, it's a lot of data. That's my goal. So I want more data in there, like Matt says. I, don't, I want it to be usable. So if a giant 150 columns, 10 million row, that's not going to be usable. But if we break it into pieces, then it's all. So, a question? So, when we look at some of the data that we create, Okay, so it's kind of the same question. How do we know what's the right data to pull from the system? Especially from the dependent variables. Is there a definition of air quality based on the dependent variables was the question, right? Right. Um, um, so that is a question actually for one of our air quality experts, Matt Lammers or Bryce. Bryce Burke, right? Yeah, Bryce. Yeah, you're exactly right. So, so let's talk about PM two point five and PM ten. Those one on the new PM two point five, PM ten, NOS, SO two, NH three. I think there are three others. Right, right. So, NOS. So, is that it, or, or is there more than that? So we have to. Yeah. Yes, there are potentially more than that as well. But we would want to ask our man Bryce. To determine some of those particular things that we can get, there are some parts of the things that we have that aren't represented by your use. Yeah, for example, in some of the cases, I saw Meadows. Yeah, right. And then there were others, like Asicone and stuff like that. Yeah. So, and there so, more than I so well, and the best place to ask that question is on the JIRA ticket. The Mass OS JIRA ticket, Matt's already responded to one question on there. And if you, if you make a comment on that ticket, comments are on. Say, what should I really be looking at? What are these key factors? We will let Matt know, and he'll go back and respond and say, this is what you should be looking for. 
Although, do keep in mind that it's going to be different for one team than it is for another. If a team is looking at health effects for their quality, they're going to want to look at that. They're going to want to look at those. They're going to want to look at if you go by the PO10. But if you are instead worried about the business aspects of their quality, you may actually be worried about the visibility of the air. And that's something completely different. That's why I'm asking what constitutes air quality. Right? That's well, where that question goes then. So, and the answer to that question is whatever the teams compete on. Think about it like this. Pull as much data as you can reasonably pull that works for you. And then if a team says, well, I need more, then they can go back to the collection site and do the same exact thing. The whole point of sharing is if you say, I collected it like this, and here's how I got my variables, and here's what I did. We open source that, you give that code out, they go, they change some of the variables, and they go and collect more data. There's things that, like that can be done. So, I would, again, I would ask Matt for the things that you really want to focus on. I would put a comment in there. But I would also say, just like Nick said, if anybody else is looking at some variation of that, they need to go and do something else and go back to that data and look at it again. So, because that's the whole point of the competition. We're not, we're guiding a little bit, but a lot of it's we want to pie in the sky what you want to come up with to compete on. So we need as much data sitting on that collection site as possible and as much variation. And, and we will be trying to get questions from the community and everything else, which will also help us find if we go after the questions that have been that everybody's been going after for 35 years, we might miss something that these powerful tools can approach that haven't been previously approached. What are some uh, suggested tools for collecting and scrubbing? Suggested tools for collecting and scrubbing. What are some suggested tools? Sky's the limit. Um, a lot of the guys I know are using Python to do a lot of the scripts. Uh, the one thing I would suggest is something small that's ready for a distributed architecture. We are in talks right now to get us a very nice big distributed Hadoop cluster to play with. And we're, we're going to give you logins to this Hadoop cluster and you'll be able to run things against it. So think about things that can run in there simply because then you can use those resources to do that. Something like you pull down one of these data sets and it's five gigs or whatever, and then you can parse it very quickly and easily through a MapReduce architecture. This yeah. Friday's meeting at the Leonardo is all about gathering data. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the best know, ways to do it, what you should look for. But again, the tools, you know, again, the one I throw out is Python. I've heard a lot of Alton, Ben, and those guys all used it very successfully at the last competition. Um, it ports itself well to, like I said, the distributed architecture. So. Things like that. We can't say one specific one. Whatever you're most comfortable with is a good way to say it, too. But I also like to see people challenge themselves. If you're comfortable with something like a normal SQL relational database, try something NoSQL that's completely out of your company. That's what you know challenges me. Yes, Matt. I was going to say, there, a lot of these data sets are ready made for us. I yeah. think, you know, without having to bombard a site and screen scrape, we can actually grab a lot. Low hanging fruit. Um, there are some sites that we will have to screen scrape or, uh, as we saw in the previous uh, presentation, uh, use their API for our advantage, um, uh, judiciously. So, <laughs> And some we're going to try to provide in the background. The traffic one I'm working on, you're going to have to set up a login and then it has essentially a site where you can pull data. But I'm also talking to that same group about getting one of their SQL Server databases in the background. And then we would have to literally restore it somewhere, pull it off, and get all the data out of it. So there's there's work like that being done as well, and it should come up in the next hopefully week. So now would be the time to go into um, some of the different things that people here in the community are doing or have uh, very interested in. So I guess first of all, how many people here have actually done something with big data or something that's related to those architectures? Most people. Are. How many here apparently consider themselves a the database? <laughs> <laughs> <That's very funny>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, we have, I guess, first we need that probably of a picture maybe from the Hadoop perspective. Sure. Just say, this is why Hadoop is different than a relational database from architecture. And then maybe branding, because yours is a very different thing when we talk about distributed architectures. Uh, and then maybe Craig, from the Elasticsearch perspective, talk about how search 
it was very vast and very fun to see the Americans teach that And I think we've got several other people here that are about it. We've worked with a lot of tools, so maybe we can each say, well, I work with a different architecture after those that we just I mean, it's a good question, too. Well, that's what I'm wondering. How many have a relational database in place? And you're considering looking into a NoSQL solution or a big data solution related to it. OK, so only a few of you. So we probably won't go too far into that. But if you want to go into that, I have slides and stuff that can talk to that point, too, as well, because that's what I created. But um, Matt definitely can start out with the Hadoop side. And then, like I said, if you have questions about that, I can field a lot of those. But this is definitely, we want to talk about projects that you guys have worked on, Randy, um, Craig, Matt, projects of what you did to go from one place to another. Um, and I was going to say, let's get, take a quick five minutes if anybody wants another pizza or anything before we get started in the next section. Mm -hmm. So, and then let Matt come up. And but if you want water, pizza, grab some really quick. We'll take a quick break and then we'll get started. Yeah. No. No. So we've uh, been meeting with their um, various. So we're going to do this. This is how the data is used to solve Maybe that will treasure. You want to see something specific go there. Yeah. It should be fun. I work for a company called Works. Work up here. Yeah, it's been fun. I For those watching, we're taking a quick break and we'll be back in just a minute. Okay. 
All right, so I um, want to start off by saying please interrupt me if anyone has any questions at any time or wants to correct anything I have to say. Um, certainly, uh, I'm here to learn as just as much as anyone else. <laughs> um, so, like I said, I've been using Hadoop, uh, actually HBase, uh, since the very, very early days. Um, I love these technologies because of the flexibility it's given me to solve certain core problems uh, that businesses are often facing. Uh, you know, coming from an Oracle MySQL uh, world, moving into a um, to what Hadoop gives me, gave me a lot of flexibility to solve some problems uh, in an expedited fashion. Uh, they were with pain, I will say that. They, this is the very early days, and even now they're still uh, bleeding edge. Um, but that's where we all get together and we talk about those things so we can avoid pitfalls and uh, take advantage of what the next greatest thing is. So a um, little bit about Hadoop since that's the new thing. I heard some new uh, people that are new out here. What Hadoop gave me that a, a Oracle or MySQL did not was um, exactly what was mentioned over here, the structured environment. I wanted something that was unstructured. I wanted, uh, you heard me talk about a data lake. I wanted one common repository for everything, regardless of schema. So even if the schema is evolving, that's that's a common business problem, is the schema will evolve over time. And how do I put that into a, say, a traditional database? You're, you're always adding columns and then trying to figure out what the common value is to backfill kind of thing. Uh, so I can do that very easily now uh, with enormous numbers of columns, and I don't have to rewrite any data. Um, so that's one of the things that really drew me to this technology. Uh, the, the power to process and get around the multi or the single core or even a multi-core, but you're still on a single machine to process the data. That was not really available in the early days, uh, MySQL or, or Postgres. Uh, now they can do it much easier. But if I wanted to write a distributed query, uh, that was really painful. Uh, but I can do that very, very easily with the MapReduce. Now, MapReduce is not meant for the response times of SQL, as you are probably or newer technologies coming out that are uh, closing that gap significantly. Um, questions? I mean, I can go as deep as you guys want to go. Um, so I can start off with what is to do? What is the stack? I can go to how do I set it up? Um, I can dive into some details on a a retail client that I just did a, a, a greenfield project for, um, minus some specifics, yes? Okay. Sure. Hadoop is a distributed processing framework. I'll leave it like that. It, its power is that it takes what you used to have to provide coordinated effort for, meaning uh, like thread, uh, concurrency, uh, distributing data, data reliability, and abstracts that all away. I don't have to worry about any of that anymore. What I do need to worry about is the algorithms, the business intelligence. That is where I feel like I can provide the most value to my uh, customers and my clients, uh, where they get the most investment, bang on the buck, they're investing in human capital and domain experts <laughs> rather than in the technology stack itself. Okay, so. I say it's a framework because it provides um, the, the data redundancy. You have what are called the master nodes, slave nodes, and data nodes. Uh, the master nodes are basically think about a good old uh, library. I want to go find a book. Where do I go? How do I go find that book? I have to go find an index that points me in the right direction. So there, these are the, the master nodes. Um, the slave nodes, uh, they typically contain uh, what's called a data node. They, they store the data, they handle requests for data, and then they handle all the um, replication. So if, if I go over to one with a shotgun and I want to say, you're dead, bam, uh, I can do that and I can feel safe because it's going to notice and it's going to start redirecting all the, the data to another one. Uh, this is, if I can bring a shotgun into a data center, you know, watch out. Uh, but it does happen. Um, uh, recently I've seen um, a very expensive network design, uh, nice high-end core uh, Cisco system, partition itself. You guys know what a network partition is? 
Randy, what you tell us about it. It's, it's anything that segment you keep from the resolutions. Right. It's usually like first terminal or cable. Yeah. So the way to envision it, so that's exactly right. It's what separates machines. Two very expensive racks of servers, and if they can't talk to one another, half of them are useless to me. And they're, they're, they're a big problem. Now what happens in that event is Hadoop's going to say, hey, I just lost a rack. Maybe the, the PDUs, the power distribution system, went out, and uh, we've all of a sudden lost 40 machines. That's a big problem in a normal environment. Hadoop, what it's going to do is going to say, hey, I've lost all this. Uh, we're going to start replicating like crazy. So you see your disk just go crazy trying to make copies of itself, and hopefully you don't run out of space. And maybe you have other racks that, uh, that things go to. Um, so that's, that's one problem I don't have to worry about, other than the network itself it needs to be somewhat reliable. Um, usually there's a top of rack switch, and they're cross-connected to, to one another, and then they go up to a core. It can get fairly, um, fairly complicated. Um, it started off as, when I say 40 machines, that can get kind of pricey. That's single U machines. Uh, it started off as commodity hardware. That was by design so that you did not spend the multi-million dollars that it would take to get big iron, like an Oracle, uh, well, Sun Systems, or HPs, or Superdomes. You know, you could go down and get your Dell server, you know, for pennies on the dollar compared to Sun, right? Uh, but you also got the reliability difference. Uh, Dell was far less reliable than, than a Sun system. So if that thing goes away, I don't have to worry about it. It's it's the sysadmin that's got to worry about handling RMA and figuring out how to get that system back online. All I worry about is my business use case. Uh, framework. Um, the data sits in on disks, right? And the, the paradigm of Hadoop is I'm going to bring the algorithm to the disk where it's local. Network I.O., it, it's getting faster. Uh, 10 gig. I, I have 10 gig internet connects on, on the system that I'm working on now. It's extremely fast, but it's still not fast enough. But disk data on disk is extremely fast, relatively speaking. So if I bring the algorithm to that data, and I have fast RAM and relatively fast disk, I can solve a problem much, much faster. So that's the paradigm shift that we're doing. Instead of bringing the data to, to a central processor, I'm putting the algorithm out. Yes. So you're describing in contrast to relational database. Yes. But how would you describe it in relationship to a search engine, which doesn't have to duplicate all the data in the first place? In fact, it does. The, the search engines, what they do is uh, to handle the kind of queries per second that they're going to do, and to handle the indexes, they're going to replicate this thing out lots and lots. So if you go to somewhere like um, a Facebook, uh, Facebook is widely open about their architecture. Take just like solar. Solar, right. Or Elastis. So Elastis would be his, his I'm going to point to him. Um, but w what it does is it, you basically have duplication of data. So the data is all around. And if I need to go find an index, maybe it's an inverted index, right? Um, I can bring the algorithm to that. It also resides in many machines. So as I'm processing that algorithm, I don't have to, um, I can parallelize the processing and then do an algebraic uh, combination of the data later on and bring it together. So I can actually create more parallel throughput by having multiple copies of the data everywhere. Now, real-time systems like Solar and Lucene and, and uh, Elasticsearch, you know, Elasticsearch is outside of the Hadoop. Um, wall you can query. There's a nice little interface there, but it's not the the core like Pig or um, even <coughs> HBase is slightly different in what it does. But I can go in HBase for the NoSQL questions as well. Does that does that answer? Kind of. Yeah, I don't want to. Yeah, yeah. I, I we can talk later. I can go into that. Um, so so the idea is you bring the you you make copies of the data. You bring the algorithm to the data, and then you do a combination or an algebraic. Uh, um, shuffle and sort and combination, reduce it back out to a common answer. Um, Hadoop is uh, is 
old MapReduce is good for one thing, which is processing vast amounts of data. It's really bad at providing data in real time. Real time is relative. Um, what what Fitz may think is required for a user experience, maybe in the, on the order of milliseconds, but for my use case, I'm measured in days. That to me is fantastic because uh, I'm solving completely different use cases. Okay, so Hadoop itself, if I want to run native MapReduce or Pig or Hive, is not meant for a real-time online system. Flat out, wrong use case. There are systems that you bolt on to the side that, re, that use these resources. HBase is a great example of that. That uses the same disk store, the same infrastructure to serve out real-time queries. And it handles the, re, the redundancy and the failover and all that automatically. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. So what are the Two benefits of using of using storage for um, I, I think that there's two. I, I, my opinion is that it, it, it's easier to write to um, if you don't have to do and checks, and it's easier. But well, what's the thing? Is it faster? So there, there. The, the question is, what are the what are a couple of the big benefits or, or contrast compare document-based storage versus a columnar, row column format, right? Um, I think the, the answers are wide and a lot of people have different opinions. Um, my philo philosophy is often, as you just heard me earlier, delay um, intelligence until you absolutely need it. That means if I'm putting in row columnar, I've already made the decision of what the data should look like. That means if I want to change my business use case in the future, I may have to go back to the data, and I may have to reprocess it. Um, if I ever lose the data, now you get into things like design. Is this a system of record? If it's a system of record, I, I sure hope that you're keeping a copy of the underlying raw data set somewhere and before you process it. Um, what I've often seen in terms of architectures, I've seen ETL processes that will load in and when, when they load in, they archive a copy of the raw data set off somewhere else for future, in case the whole system blows up or I had a bug in my code when I actually did some sort of pre-processing. Pre-processing is important, even in document storage. Um, one of the analytics uh, companies I worked for wanted to do a location, a GOIP kind of lookup. <laughs> if, if we were serving out data or even trying to do uh, data mining against this data set, Doing a lat long lookup for every single IP across billions of events is extremely expensive. Secondly, that data never changes. It, once it's been there, once the record's been created, this particular data set never changes. That was should be immutable, right? So I have raw, and then I have a semi-processed state, and then from that semi-processed state, I can then run my my batch jobs or even you know other jobs against that. Um, I also use row columnar format with Hive significantly. But to take advantage of the document-based approach, it's not raw at that point. I have a structure to it. It's, it's uh, Avril is the, my tool of choice, or you could use some sort of other um, uh, serialization format. But Avril allows me to do this schema evolution so that I can store a document, but it's encoded with the um, schema in the header in the actual file itself. It gives me a row columnar format that I want to, if I wanted to, do a query. Now, if I come back tomorrow and I say um, I want to add 20 new fields, but I want to keep everything else, I can easily do that, and I can write queries that will query two data sets, completely different schemas, and they will be able to be compatible. I can do this, and I can do a mapping, one on top of one another. I can get all of, all the columns for immediate uh, utilization. So that's, that's something that's an extremely powerful tool uh, that we have at our uh, fingertips now. Um, did I ask your question? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, great. Well, let's yeah. open that one to the floor, too. You know, does anybody else see advantages of document store versus something else? I'll take an example that I like, which is also for document store. We had a large document store in one of our systems. It was a relational system. It was a MySQL system. 
But I think about using it for something like Hadoop because I could store all the documents cheaper. I could store them as documents, essentially, sitting in HDFS. I could process them two years from now. And if I wanted to go back and change how I process them, I could do that again. And I'd have this nice, big, cheap storage to have the entire document. It's like you said, with rows and columns, you're kind of, I've made the decision. And that's expensive, probably. So I have to keep a certain amount. Like you were asking earlier, we can't keep 155 columns. But if a, a document has 155 different properties, so what? It doesn't take up as much space. It's sitting there on the disk. And then you can reprocess it again later. So that's, that's a use case that I've seen for something like that. So again, anyone else want to um, venture something too as well? Yeah, and I mean, anytime you're building like a dynamic framework like a CRM or e-commerce, like if you've ever looked at Magenta's code base, so they have an architecture <laughs> called EAB, which is SQL driven, and and it's the biggest nightmare you've ever seen. And and um, so I've built something, you know, similar architecture, but in a in a NoSQL environment, a document driven, and so much more flexible to be able to dynamically create your col your columns and, and whatnot. So if you don't know ahead of time what your schema is going to look like and that's driven based off of user input, it's a huge benefits. Yeah. Please. So <clears throat> one of the advantages, like Mark Logic is a good example of this, because when you're doing schema on read mm -hmm. instead of schema on write, mm -hmm. you don't have to pre-allocate <clears throat> where everything's going. Mm -hmm. You have lots of different sources. You don't have to converge on a canonical data model in order to move the things together. And right. so that's part of the reason I was asking around the search, because having a combination, because search does preserve those dimensions of the data without forcing you to define the schema ahead of time. So there's some real advantages. Of and then as you move into search as well, you've got the advantage of speed mm -hmm. because you can move a lot of that query into memory. Um, and you don't have to do massive reprocessing of MapReduce jobs yep. in order to perform the same query on the data. Like you said, it didn't change. Yet you got to go re-MapReduce re it because you didn't know what question to ask. Yeah. And it, that's a good uh, pattern that I've seen out there. It reminds me. So I, I went from the raw to semi-processed to even further processed, more refined. But hopefully you have a data dictionary that tells you how or there's lots of um, genealogy, whatever you want to call it. You know how you got from point A to point B to point C. When it was refreshed, what data sources came into it. Um, but by doing so, you can vastly speed up your process. Well, that's good. What kind of structure do you use for um, a document database where you you could be doing joins on, like, like if in a traditional MySQL database, you might do a join or something. But um, because you don't have joins, you're you pack everything into the document into like one document, uh, or pack as much as you can, or do you try to do some kind of, um, you know, like use some kind of uh, software that does it at one time that adds, does a join basically. So I think the question is, is um, where, how do you do? Joins right if there's no schema right. So the question that my answer is it depends on what the tool is you're using to get at the data. Hadoop itself, like I said, it's a framework. You can bolt anything onto it. Search is a bolt-on. Pig, MapReduce, that's kind of the core of MapReduce, but it's still a bolt-on. You have a framework that distributes data. You have a framework that distributes processing. As long as you can take care of that or take advantage of that API, you can get at anything. Okay meaning you can get at the data. Now, if I were to take a specific example uh, with a document, um, suppose I have a uh, JSON document or uh, in you know, section A. Section B, I have another JSON document, or maybe even XML. Okay? And I wanted to join these two data sets together to produce a new combination of data sets. Um, I actually saw a really interesting thing somewhere. Um, so high, high availability.com. Anyone else read that blog? You see why, why data needs to have sex? You see that? It, it, I was like, what? But that's what we're doing. Is we're taking two, two different data sets, we're combining them together, we're, we're, we're putting their genomes together, and we're creating something new out of it. So in order to do something like this, um, 
we you have to do some sort of processing on that document. Something has to understand that document. It's going to produce a schema. It's going to say these fields are in here and it needs to know how to process it. So if I were to take the example of pig to read XML or JSON, or the other way around from our earlier example, um, they're both going to come up and they're both going to cr create a representation of the schema in, in this high level language. And then you can do a normal join off of that. The abstraction of is handled for you in terms of reading the data. So all the reading of the data, all the parsing, all that stuff is done. Uh, your worries, and then you're just dealing with columns or, or just fields at that point. Because it's very, very easy to do. Joints in big data are hard. Because if you consider your, you take a multi-billion row or document um, data store, and I want to join it against itself, that's that's worst case, right? Maybe it's a Cartesian product. It could be huge. Joins in big data are, um, you, you can spend a long time doing that. In fact, I would say, you know, as I go through this processing chain, where do I spend the most time? Data preparation. Getting to know my data, looking for problems, anomalies in the data, and then storing it. After that, everything else becomes much easier. I find I spend most of my time debugging problems that should have been caught in the data ingestion piece. So something that's not cool, not sexy, it's not glamorous, data ingestion is probably the, the biggest um, bang for your buck. Spend your time there and you'll pay off in dividends. So do you try to avoid coins? No, no I'm not saying don't avoid them. I'm just saying they're, they're painful. Yeah. They're hard. Yeah, understand tools. It would depend on the tool. Yeah. So it's different, it's a different role. So a relation of the join makes sense with a document oriented database like Mark Logic, right? You're, if you think of a table, your rows become individual documents, right? And now when I query, I'm drilling through those documents, but I can put an index on a particular field, and that's where search comes in, because I'm sure it's likewise with, with Hadoop, or, you know, likewise. I can pick a particular field in that index. And when I query, I'm leveraging the index. And then some other attribute in the document be that text or some field to get back the result. But I'm not doing a left to outer join, inner join like SQL wise. I'm, it's a, that's a totally different paradigm for the yeah. It's a totally different data model. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. 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 And, and that's true. In, in the, the pig, MapReduce, Hive world, the, the reason why they're painful is because it doesn't fit in main memory. It doesn't even fit in main memory across many machines. You're, you're streaming data across itself, and you're looking for collisions, kind of. So to speak, trying to say where do these two match, and and that's that's why it's problematic, and that's where you'll spend some time uh, using some of the tools that are available to you that they optimize your hints that get you fast. Yeah. So at, at the product level, it's still fuzzy in my mind. You know, I think a lot of times when people say Hadoop, they kind of think of HBase and, and Hive, and like at the actual code level, what is Hadoop? Is it the MapReduce portion of it? Or? So that's a great question. So the question is, is what is core Hadoop? What ships from Apache, right? Um, core Hadoop um, is the HDFS file system, MapReduce, Pig. Hive often comes with it, right? HBase is separate. That's a separate project, but it requires to do. Um, and that's about it. Yeah, and those, those are completely separate. Those are bolt-ons. Hadoop is just the framework. You'll see a group that all they do is HDFS. I mean, nothing works without HDFS. Wouldn't you include uh, Yarn in there? Yeah, so the schedulers go in there. Which really changes the makeup of the whole thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes, thank you. That's So you, I mean, you have to have a processing a scheduler and a resource manager, all those kinds of things. So, and yes. To your point, MapReduce was really good at one thing, right? Indexing the internet and really bad at pretty much everything else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so my latest project was to actually take a graph problem and try and solve it with MapReduce. Uh, it solved it better than any other that we could find. Um, so, yeah, new novel design, and that's why I'm happy with the day. It was taking weeks before a day I'm happy. So did you have a limited number of data elements that were data connections? Oh, no. It, it was huge. Uh, the, the in and out degrees were on the order of many thousands per, per vertex. So the, uh, 
I, I, I call it a hyper-connected graph. I don't know if there's such a term, but it was so well connected that it was actually very hard to pull things apart. Um, and that made, that's what took the pro what makes the processing so hard. So I can't split it up very well. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you you probably have the question is have we looked at anything outside of MapReduce um, into the next generation? It is true. MapReduce is uh, it's it serves one purpose well, but it's slow. And so the next generation of um, of uh, tools, uh, Spark is probably the, the, the most promising on the, for, on the horizon. We'll try and, and take um, what were considered huge batches of data and to move those into called micro batches of data. And it speeds up uh, processing many orders of magnitude. Um, Google, uh, I, my, uh, my coworker went to their conference. They said they haven't used MapReduce in years. It's dead, dead to them. Of course, they never, you know, they weren't using Hadoop as we know it today, but it was dead to them. Um, and they're using these more real-time things in the cloud. Spark is, is a big one. It's got a big following. Storm is another one that you probably have heard of. Um, they do things slightly differently, but um, they are, they, they, again, they, they bring down that time to uh, produce a data set much, much smaller. What would be because you're... Um, spinning up JVMs, you're doing garbage collection, you're doing all this sort of uh, uh, resource uh, management is now down to, you know, something that takes 10 seconds as opposed to 10 minutes. So it's a huge difference. Yeah? How much of that reduction is, is based on hardware, do you think, versus? None. Oh, really? All out algorithms. Okay. I'm just a bit hearing a lot about solid state, whatever devices that I think, and also the algorithms. They are. Uh, the common, the hardware vendors, forgive me, anyone that's a hardware vendor, they'll come and try and sell your SSD. And um, my approach has always been SSDs are a waste of money in this uh, because what you're really after are spindles and CPUs. So, and parallel. If it, you know, I could load up a machine with SSDs, but the cost to load it up with SSDs is still higher than maybe two or three individual machines. And I'll get more processing out of two or three machines than a single one any day. So, um, but back to your question about you know, hardware, you can take the same problem, you know, if I, you know, from my perspective, a graph problem, and I want to look at it with um, MapReduce, and I want to look at it versus Spark. Spark is going to be much, much faster because the algorithm is, um, it loads things up into memory, and then it does actually memory-to-memory -memory, uh, communication. It's much faster, much more efficient than uh, trying to produce a, a data set in a silo in this one machine and then uh, reduce that out and ship it off to another for further processing. Why, when you describe a graph problem, why would you have started with something like Neo4j or Titan? Uh, they weren't well suited for what we tried to do. Um, our, our particular use case was um, uh, we tried giraffe. I'll, I'll give you a good example of giraffe. Giraffe was crushed because the, the particular architecture of Giraffe, um, you bring up a particular data model in memory, and then it's going to communicate with all the others in memory, back and forth. The message passing times out because it's passing thousands of messages out, thousands of messages back in, just to get an answer, and it shuts down. Blames, I can't do it. So Giraffe was out for us. So the, the data often drives the tool. Um, and that's why I say you got to spend time with your data. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the others, uh, they were, uh, they were, uh, we didn't look at Neo4j. We, we wanted a Hadoop environment because we wanted a data platform itself to start with. Titan, yeah, it probably could have done a lot of work. We're actually looking at it now for the next generation. Um, but uh, that wasn't available to us for a variety of reasons before. The data model was all that we're using is all um, just whatever is in um, Hadoop. So int strings, just just a, a little ball of what we call an event, and that event has some some connection to another by certain attributes. We stripped out everything else. 
we didn't care about anything else. So we were able to gain performances by stripping out, and that's one of the, the paradigms you'll see in, in MapReduce is filter early, filter often, project only the things that you really want, drop everything else, and that way you're, you're transmitting data is much, much uh, more efficient. You know, it's just a, one of those paradigms. Yeah. Any other questions? So when I say bolt-ons, there, there are a lot of bolt-ons to Hadoop. I'd put Mahout or HBase or uh, a lot of those other things in those camps. Um, a lot of tools are built on HBase, or sorry, HDFS, and you can get access to that uh, feature um, set. Um, but you know, they're, they're different conversations. So are you seeing much movement, <clears throat> given that you know the base of training data people is so happy in SQL? It seems like there's a real movement of SQL on Hadoop and Paula yeah. and some of these other tools. Are you seeing that trend starting to take place so that you don't have to retrain SQL yeah. developers so that, to become Java? And that right. Program? So. The question is, is with all the tools that are becoming available for um, Hadoop, for native SQL people, you know, are we seeing uh, the uh, trend going to people using that? Absolutely. Um, one of the, the worst things you want to do is jar the system, right? So what, what I do is I go in and I say, Here, here's your platform. I'm going to make it work for both your engineers. I'm going to make it work for your business analysts. I don't want the business analysts to have to worry about Java. And uh, I want to give the raw power of um, Hadoop to the engineers. They they write completely different things, right? Um, so through some of the newer technologies, uh, H Catalog would be another one I, I forgot to mention in the core. H Catalog um, allows JDBC connections in to run MapReduce jobs, and so they can get in there. Hive is another tool um, that business analysts can use. It's very SQL-like. It does not have all the SQL 92 or any other extensions to it, but it is very powerful for the business analysts. Impala, I looked at Impala. Um, I really like it. Um, one of the big problems with Impala is um, I'm producing data outside of Impala. So if I want to look at it in Impala, I have to reset my catalog, my cluster. Because I had so much data, and then the schema was so weird, it actually crushed the cluster for two hours. That's a non-starter for me. I cannot have that. Uh, but I hear the next generation is talking with the cloud air engineers. The next generation, they're saying um, that they're going to only index the things that have changed. So they'll do some smart analysis, and it will become much uh, less impact and more useful to me and to the business users. We actually, we actually just bought two weeks ago and had a CTO of Cloudera. And one of their biggest pushes is people on the new So they're looking for tools that can do that because there's lots of people already out there that are using that and they can market it faster. Well, Teradata with Aster has been that. I mean, I think they were really the pioneers of SQL on the do, but it yeah. seems to be spreading. So the, the reality is it's, it's a challenge, right? Yeah. Yes. Essentially, it's beautiful. Call it on, on cloud air is great. But it goes back to your point early on. That's what's your use case, right? Because if you've got a one-day use case, no problem. That might work really well. But that's not, that's not actually what people think about. They think about interactive analytics, right? And, and for most use cases that I've seen in practice, it's just not there. I think Spark is one of the, the ones that's really intriguing, yeah. but it's still got a long way to go. Mm -hmm. So here, here's the other other problem. Uh, okay, why, why is he doing that? I've seen developers do SQL queries that are this long on a printout. Nested queries all over the place. That's impossible to maintain. Right, I mean, you have to be really good to maintain that. Um, the Hive parser or the Hive optimizer actually took some of those queries and was horrible, absolutely horrible. So, would I run that in production? Heck no. I'd put it to an. I'd say, business analyst, build me a, um, build me an algorithm or build me what I need to solve, and then I go get an engineer, make it productionalized. You'll. Save time that way. 
Trust me on that. So, did you want to? Yeah, I was just going to break in to kind of show a general idea. Again, mine's a relational model. I went from relational relational to the do to Elasticsearch. But what I wanted to show up here, which you're going to find on all these architectures, and I know Randy can get time to come up and, and Craig as well. But what you're going to see is, you know, you have a core layer. You have something that's your master system of record. You have something where the data came from. Whether that's Oracle, MySQL, whether that's flat files, whatever that may be, you have some sort of source of data. Then you have some sort of processing layer, batch processing in my case for Hadoop. That could be React, that could be Cassandra, that could be MapR, it could be anything. But you have something that processes data. And then we usually have what's called a speed layer, which in our case we use Elasticsearch. And Elasticsearch helped us get real-time queries out of the data that we just processed. Have you, have you run into scaling issues with Elasticsearch? Because it doesn't scale as well as um, right now, no. <laughs> Future, we'll see. <laughs> There's still a lot to be done on ours. Um, but yeah, the Elasticsearch has been returning queries very quickly compared to our old relational system. So how big is the data got? Um, in terms of total size, we don't have more than a terabyte in the system. So, and again, this is a good, a wonderful indication of everybody saying, I have five terabytes that I process every day. So what? <laughs> you don't need a lot of data to make a big data solution. What we created was a very cost-effective scale-out solution. We don't have more than one terabyte anywhere at any time. As a matter of fact, our largest processing is probably no more than a couple hundred megs, maybe a gig at a time. But we now have a solution that can scale as far as we want it to because we changed these processes. So, OK, but uh, Randy, why don't you come up and talk as well? I'll leave this up. But I also wanted to just get the projector shut off in a minute, so. But you can use some of that as kind of some simple cases. You know, the different layers that you always run into, batch processing, real time. But tell us more about React and what you've been working on as well. So my perspective is completely orthogonal to Matt's. <laughs> Um, what I do with REAC is very real-time, very transactional. Uh, most of our data comes from mobile devices or websites. Um, we, the company I work for is called Basho. The database that we make is called REAC. And the way it works is it's a very simple thing. It's a distributed hash table. So how many of you are familiar with what a hash table is? Most of you. Um, and a distributed hash, a, a hash table is literally just a two-column a two table where the first column is a key and the second column is a value. That's literally all that it is. And that's the entire data model of React. Um, it's, I guess you could call that columnar, but, I, but that's not how I naturally think about it. Um, I, you know, in programming, a hash table is something that I use a lot. Um, and persisting it to disk was pretty easy, but then if that disk crashes, then that whole hash table is gone. The thing about REAC is that it's a distributed hash table. So what happens is, uh, the, so the whole reason why this thing exists is uh, before this, the way people would scale MySQL or Postgres is they would put data in one database for, and then when that database got really big, they would move like some of those tables to another database, and then they would have the, the application manage which database to go to for what thing. Uh, and each database or each machine was a partition, and if you lose a machine, you wouldn't be able to read your data. Um, I actually experienced this firsthand while working at Intermountain Healthcare. I wrote a rule engine that was, it's called Foresight, but basically what happens is, it's this really nice horizontally scaled middleware piece that would accept requests like fire rules and tell you things about patients. Um, when it determined things, it would write them into an Oracle database. And if that Oracle database ever crashed or couldn't be communicated to, like everything stopped. And I absolutely hated that. Like I didn't want a situation where that happened, but that's how it was. So um, I started looking at what do I really want I to hire a database? Will translation services please dial the hospital operator? Translation services. Awesome. Please dial the hospital yeah, operator. Yeah, so I wanted a system that I could hire a database to do a job. Yes. Speaking creative, we just want to do something again. So 
I wanted to know how to do this. Um, I found, and I was looking at queuing systems, I was trying to figure out what I should do. Um, REOC is a system that automatically manages those partitions. So the, well, there's a few academic papers that Amazon put out. And one of them is what inspired us to build this thing. It's, uh, it talks about a ring architecture for a shopping cart on a website that makes it so that you can always complete your purchases even if they have back-end database failures. The way that that happens is we build a ring where on the ring there's a bunch of partitions and, and machines claim pieces of that ring. And as you add nodes or take nodes away, ring ownership changes. Or partitions will move automatically from one machine to another. Um, because it's a key value store, there's no query planner. So all it has to do is take the request and move those replicas to different partitions. So it's pretty automatic about placing those replicas. It's automatic about how it uses a hash to we lay those down. Uh, so what most people do, because it's a uh, 13 emergency department, room 12. A 13 emergency department, room 12. A 13 emergency department, room 12. Yeah, that sounds really important. We usually get a caller. Yeah. Anyway, so to answer your question, what most people do is they put a load balancer in front of React, and as you add or, or like remove nodes, you change the list of nodes that's in the load balancer list. So that makes it super elastic, um, you, and because it's such an easy query pattern, it's really easy to say five, five machines will process X requests per second, depending on the hardware. Maybe it's 5,000, maybe it's 10,000, whatever. If you want to add more capacity, you add more nodes, update your load balancer <coughs> list, and you get that capacity. So it's really nice from a from a capacity planning perspective, from a predictability perspective. Um, s s some of our largest customers are processing 550,000 requests per second. Um, if you don't need that much, then don't buy that, all that hardware. <laughs> That's really all that comes down to. Uh, use cases. Key value, you have to know the key to find the data. It has absolutely nothing to do with search. It gets, it's not search. It's not analytics. You need to know what you're going after to find that data. Basically what happens is the key is probably in memory, so it can point to where on disk that value actually lives. And on disk, it's literally just a write-ahead log with key term. It's all that it is. It's nice and simple. Um, when you are doing this query, um, it just goes and finds it and hands it back to you. So a use case that that's really good for is session data or profile data. If you have a use case, like I have a set-top box that is in my living room called Xfinity Comcast. They are a customer, by the way. Um, your account name is known to that set-top box. It's probably your email address. And all they do is they go look that up in their key value store. They can tell, tell you with one, like, order one lookup all the cable providers you subscribe to. And if they want to add a new provider, they just update that value and save that key. And if their backend crashes, it doesn't matter because it replicates that data three times by default. And you can always go get your account information that way. So it's very unlikely that if you have such a device that it can't find your account information unless you pull the cable out from your device and you create your own network partition. Which happens. So, so um, that makes it really good in an operational kind of application where you're, you're loading data, right? you're getting data in. What about from an analytics? Is there stuff in the app that helps nope. me? There is not. So for me, uh, the whole thing that Matt mentioned about Hadoop, that's an add-on to me. <laughs> so the whole like, Hadoop analytic ecosystem is my add-on. It's something that we absolutely don't do. Um, unless you can figure out how to model the data from an access pattern perspective up front. So if you know it's pretty trivial to model that in some form of a key value data model and then go after that data. But if you don't know what you're going after, you will never find that data in React. There are features in React, like um, secondary indexes. 
that if you know those up front, then you can build those and put those in too, and then you can query it different ways. Those do not scale nearly as well as key value. If you get billions and trillions of petabytes of data, then that will tax the system more than the simple straight key value lookup. That's just physics, basically. There's that, like that's the limiting factor is that there's only so much you can do with secondary indexes in such a system. Um, we also bolt on solar as well for full text search and passive search. The nice thing about solar is, you know, like Reox written in Erlang, which uses supervisors, actors, and process management. It has its own scheduler built into it. Um, it's been around since the 80s. Runs most of the telecom stuff. Um, so it's it's really good at that job. Really good at restarting failed processes and making sure that data lands in different places. It does it in a eventually consistent way. So it may not be immediate. You, like It's very likely that if you write a piece of data, you, you won't be able to read it like immediately, but you'll eventually be able to. And by eventually, I mean in milliseconds usually, unless there's, unless there's a network partition, in which it'll hold it, and you can still read it from the side that, that you wrote it on, not the other side. But where am I going with this? Well, like in React, everything is masterless. There's no concept of master and slave. So you can write to every node, read from every node. Um, and if it has the replicas, or if it can find the replicas, it'll hand those back to you. No single, those are evil for availability. So, like, so React is built for extreme availability, and the solar, the solar add-on that we put in there, is the, the the way we treat it is we write the data to key value, we write the data to a solar index, and we make that so that it's near real time. There's no batch loading into solar. It happens as you write it to KV, and it's distributed as well. So if you query one of the coordinating nodes, it figures out which solar index is around the ring that data lives in, and it hands it back to you. And you can still do that with the solar query. So you can use the solar solar query syntax. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of different things. So I, <clears throat> I've heard React not only as a key value pair, but described as a document based spot. So is that, I mean, but everything you've described so far is sounds like a pure key value. It's a, so the lines have been graying over time. Like the, so like the original Gartner Magic Quadrant is not quite as magic as it once was. <laughs> like the document that you put in there, it's just a bunch of bytes that's opaque to React. It doesn't really do anything like Mongo does, like index the like fields, unless you give it a solar schema, and then it will. And then you can query it with solar syntax and do all your combinatorial joins, like this field and that field. You can do all those ad hoc queries from a solar perspective, but only then. So, so do you guys compete with Mongo, or is it really more specific <laughs> use cases that you know fit better? I I would say we compete more with Cassandra. I don't consider us competing with Mongo at all because a it's master slave and they drop data all the time. <laughs> so if you like to lose your data, use Mongo. <laughs> <laughs> and also, we get a ton of customers that use Mongo that hate it. So do you, do you consider it kind of more memory intensive or hardware? Um, where, where do you see this? So, if you have a big giant key space, and if you're using BitCast for the back end, those key values are in memory, but not the actual value. So that can blow memory on nodes. Not likely, though, because it takes a ton, like trillions of keys before that ever happens. Uh, most of the time, we're disk-bound or, or network-bound. Um, we tend to be like um, network-bound first, just because every time we push a write, we're doing replication across the nodes. So we have... Uh, yeah, it, it, like, so like React loves its, its memory, its disk, and its network. Just loves that stuff. And it, it's, yeah. Sorry, you should mention yes, we can have Yeah, so um, multi tenancy is a thing now. Um, people love it when they can just store files into React. Problem with React is by itself, if you put a big file in as a key and a value, that will clog the, the, like, the gossip protocol and the replication channel. So what we do for the S3 protocol is if you hand it a gigabyte file, we have a piece of software that will take that, chop it up into a thousand chunks, store a thousand chunks and build a manifest file. And that's fronted by an S3 interface. So that allows you to have use cases like object storage either internal or service provided off-premise storage. Like basically if you want to be Amazon but not pay them money, 
then you could install this and have S3 storage. Um, it tracks, um, you know, like S3, it, you have to have a uh, access key, basically, and it tracks all the usage under that access key, and it, it, and it will give you reports in terms of how much storage is being utilized by each tenant. Which, which then you can use internally for billbacks, chargebacks. You can actually make people pay for what they're using. So it's it makes storage more of a commodity. Um, prototypical piece that I worked on recently was something called Rhinomo, which is Reoc plus DynamoDB. So if you're using DynamoDB in Amazon, um, that is something that you can start using. <laughs> Basically, it's the same API. Use the Java client, point it at this, and it'll like behave the same way. Uh, so it's very good at file storage, very good at content use cases, like um, gaming uses it all the time for top scores. Uh, like my kids play this game called the Classic Clans, and like the top 10 players in the world, that score list is viewed more than where I actually come in at on the score. <laughs> my scores are like thousands of pages down. And so there's different access patterns and read-write ratios depending on which section of the score list you're looking at. Um, there are types in React now. Didn't used to be, but like a, a, a sorted set, a distributed sorted set. So if you are tracking currency and you're just doing writes as fast as you can across different nodes and different clusters and different geo data centers, all that data can be accumulated, and then you can do a single read to get the set and actually see what the set's value is. And it will deal with network partitions. So if you have network partition on half the country, it still gets all the rights on that side. And when that heals, that sorted set will heal by doing a union. That's that's called a conflict resolvable data type, or conflict free resolvable data type. It's basically a data type like a set or a map counter it has a merge function, makes it so that it's monotonic and item -based. Um key things with MapReduce, which you can do in React, but like Matt said, MapReduce is dead to me <laughs> for several reasons. But those functions have to also be item potent and community even associated. So that on the reduce phase, all of that stuff can be treated the same way because you never know when, when a network's going to fail and when a job comes in impartially and has to be restarted. So there's a whole field in academia on what's happening with distributed computing. There are papers for highly available transactions. There are papers for life after distributed transactions, um, building CRDTs. Uh, there's libraries out on GitHub like Mean Girls from Aper. If you haven't read Aper's blog, by the way, you really should. Um, he writes about how highly available these systems actually are. He has one for everything you can think of. One for RabbitMQ, for Elasticsearch, for MongoDB, for Cassandra, for Riot, for every major thing that's out there, he has some tools that he will run data against it and see where it tips over, see how, how much data will be lost, and tell you, if you use RabbitMQ this way, you'll lose 80% of your data. What was the website? Um, APHR, A-P-H-Y-R, just Google that. And the, there's a blog called Call Me Maybe. Yeah, you just did a great one on Boston. You did. Really detailed too. Yeah. I will do that for you, yes. Yeah, call call me maybe is an excellent blog. Um, he uses tools like Jepson to basically externally view a system that's under test to determine whether or not it does what it says that it's supposed to do. And he does a ton of research and it's if if you are considering using any system in the world you should definitely read his write-up before you say yes or no. It's one, it's one of the variables, but um, he's done a lot of good work. Uh, who else is really awesome? There's Peter Bayless from Berkeley. He has a lot of good uh, like, like academic articles as well. So, do you have questions? How would you compare Reoc to Redis? What are the uh, Redis is a master-slave Paxos scaling algorithm. Um, its sets are not distributed, and it will be a, it will become a single point of failure. But it's super fast. So if, if you value speed over availability, the Redis may be for you. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of the things that you're 
things you have to consider, the same things you have to consider on the HTTPS side. Is that also? Because I know that like region servers are the is that not just as well or are those? HBase, um, by default, I believe, is master slave for multi data center replication. Um, it does have an active active. Um, I believe that there's, I, I think it kind of falls under a lot of the same comparisons between React and Cassandra, where there's a lot of knobs for Cassandra. Like you can pick the replication lay down strategy and the network topology. You have to do this stuff manually in, in uh, Cassandra. It's less so with React, it's more you turn it on. You join nodes. It uses a consistent hash and a, a default or like um, like, like strategy for laying it down. Um, I feel like that makes it operationally easier to actually manage. I don't have to go play with J groups or any of that stuff. Um, there's things in React that are different than Cassandra. Uh, we do highly available reads. So if you have a piece of data that lands on a node that it's not intended for and you can't ship it to its real partition, it'll still serve it back out on, like on a read even though it's like primary partition is dead. Um, that's not something Cassandra does. They would, it, it, like, they hold it, but it waits until it lands on the partition. So there are differences between the two. Um, I think Cassandra, it's also a big table model, which is really good for some summaries and counting and secondary indexes. We're a little bit weaker on that, but we also keep the data model very wide open. It's just a value. And that is kind of like what goes back to what Matt was saying, where you want to defer something until you know you. And that's something I've always appreciated about React. Like it doesn't really force column or every table. And it is very different from Hadoop. I like I come to these to learn what the heck Hadoop actually is, because it's <laughs> but for me it's alien. Uh, thanks guys. So, Yes. Can you guys going to stick around back for a second? I have a question. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> So I'll try to do a, a quick uh, kind of overview. If you guys haven't checked out React, it's a great system. Uh, I'd encourage you to do it. And then earlier you were talking about the SQL on Hadoop. That was probably the number one topic at the last uh, Hadoop Summit last month with SQL on Hadoop. There's a bunch of companies trying to do that. So anyway, uh, so my topic is kind of search engine related. Uh, I'm more familiar with Elasticsearch and Solar, a little bit less familiar with like Mark Logic. Uh, but Mark Logic brings a lot of interesting things to the table, uh, including graphing abilities, which is quite cool in a, in a search engine. Um, search engine is sort of not really a completely descriptive term. Um, really, at its core, a search engine is a relevance engine. It's a similarity engine. And what you do... Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, so really what you do when you form a search query, you're saying to the search engine, give me something that looks like this. Give me the closest thing that you can find that looks like this. A SQL database or most other database engines won't do that. They're looking, <laughs> you put something specific in, you get something specific back out, you're all happy. Search engine's different. Even if it doesn't find a really specific match, it'll still give you things. <laughs> it just it won't be very relevant. It will tell you. It's like, I don't think this is a good match, but this is something you may find interesting. And so it's a, it's a little bit different way of sort of thinking about the problem. You're thinking about relevance. You're thinking about similarity. 
It's also more of a, a near real-time system. So, it, so you can uh, put millions or billions of documents into you know, one of these search engines and be able to get, uh, you know, depending on your cluster size, you know, dozens or even hundreds of queries per second. And the interesting thing is that as you change your query, you change the relevance, you change the answer that you get back, right? So you can think, uh, you can think about it a little bit like a clustering problem. So usually in, in standard clustering, what you do is you take your whole data set and you try to find things that sort of fit together. In the search engine, you're really focusing on a single point. You are saying, okay, this is my point of interest. interest. What, what fits into this, right? And then as you change the query, you change what, what, that, what that universe looks like. Right, and so that's sort of the kind of the interesting thing. As Matt was stating, this is you know all these systems are kind of a bolt-on to something like Hadoop. Hadoop is great for processing; it's not necessarily an endpoint. You gotta you know get it into a form that people can use. And a lot of times, you know, that comes in the form of analytics, right? So you can do a whole bunch of processing, dump the data into into either Elasticsearch or Solar or MarkLogic, something like this, and then have it become an engine that's that's either driving driving something on your website or driving some kind of a display or a dashboard, some kind of an analytics um, that that your business people can interact with and play with and change things and and kind of get the answers uh, that they're um, that they're looking for, right? Um, analytics, in particular, for Elasticsearch, is a is a big push for them. Um, they've uh, in the latest releases they've been uh, so uh, faceting uh, is essentially a lot of faceting. It comes down to term count. So how many of this particular term or those those particular terms? So if you think of a shopping site like Amazon or whatever, you search for a book on Hadoop, it'll give you a count of how many you know books on Hadoop, how many books on React or similar categories, right? That's we call that faceting. Um, so Elasticsearch in particular has taken that and advanced it and turned it what they call aggregations, um, which uh, is a lot more flexible in terms of what you can do to get these different kinds of counts and information, and uh, also adding the ability to be able to nest uh, your aggregations. And you can keep nesting while it's limited, but you can, you can do uh, different kinds of nesting uh, and get different kinds of counts for statistics, which traditional faceting really actually didn't allow you to do. So, probably got two or three minutes if somebody wants to ask something real quick about it. I know a couple of people had some some things they were talking about, but I mean, it, it, it's it's another piece to the puzzle. There's a Hadoop is a big puzzle. <laughs> There's a lot of pieces, and this is, and this can be another, uh, another part of that. Matt had uh, talked about the architecture that they had put together and used the term speed layer for what they're uh, in in their architecture. So that term is essentially um, uh, taking data that you that you have processed in the past. So like. Uh, usually, or one of the, one of the paradigms you can have is as your data comes in, um, that day's data you'll work on it on sort of a near real time basis, and then when that day is done, you'll take that data and kind of compress it and compact it and put it into a more usable kind of form for a real time thing. So your your speed layer combines your past plus your real time present into a display for somebody. Um, it's probably a quick jumble of words, but <laughs> <laughs> it's Pat. Pat's. I said. I said Matt. It's oh, Pat's. He's got all the credit there. Yeah, there you go. It was Pat's architecture. Pat. Pat. So if you want to know more about how we use it, it's a very similar to what you said. Batch process and then load it into Elasticsearch. Yeah. So you have your batch part plus your real time part. The speed layer combines that. So, Matt. I had a question about your rivers. The okay. rivers, right? So. Yeah. Like I said, data ingestion is really important to me, me personally. Yes. So the rivers are the the format specific ways to ingest certain types of data. Is that is that the way I'm understanding? Yeah, rivers? that's sort of a, a traditional way of 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 getting data into Elasticsearch. Mm -hmm. 
that's I mean that's one of the ways, but it's a pretty easy setup. So they're 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 adapters that go out and they, they know how to parse it, turn it to a JSON document, mm -hmm. and then. Okay. But could you also feed it like bring it in through Storm and maybe filter it with Kafka and then land it and. Wow. Yeah, there's a lot of ways. Rivers, rivers are sort of a, an automated way of doing that. By the way, talking at, at Hadoop Summit with the Elasticsearch guys, uh, rivers are actually going to be going away at some point. I don't know when that point is. Uh, the new paradigm is Logstash. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's sort of a, another Elasticsearch thing is what they call the Elk stack, which is Elasticsearch. Logstash and Kibana. Kibana is the UI. Logstash is a way of ingesting data very quickly into Elasticsearch. And of course, Elasticsearch is a search engine. The cool thing is you can set up Elasticsearch, set up a stream of data using Logstash, start up Kibana, and you've, you've got a UI. You've got a dashboard. You could do uh, ad hoc queries against it. It gives you all kinds of displays, all kinds of goodies. I mean, you can you know, literally spin it up in 30, 40 minutes and have a whole bunch of a whole bunch of goodness right there, and it doesn't have. I mean, Logstash is a little bit misleading. When it was originally brought in, it was a, a quick way to ingest log data, say from a website or something like that. But it's expanded into really kind of a general conduit uh, to automatically import data into a Elasticsearch cluster. Yeah, speaking on the loading part too, we actually wrote a higher Elasticsearch. Yeah. No, they didn't have them at the time. We wrote one. <laughs> Yeah. So Elasticsearch and Solar and probably um, uh, MarkLogic as well can access or can act both as a sync or sorry as a source for for uh, Hadoop or as a sync as well. Put data in and out of it, which can be really quite handy. So usually it's a sync. Usually put into it, but having it as a source could be quite interesting as well. So. Sure. I'm trying to relate this to um, something in my experience where I, I guess uh, you, you could kind of, uh, I'm trying to remember the terms, but basically you set up a, a kind of a reporting system out of certain things. And is there kind of a place for that in, in the ecosystem that you're talking about where there's a way to set up a report with different fields and somebody could go in and select a date range, say, or, or Things such as that fairly easily. Yeah. Kind of a novice user interface uh, that's that's brand new for somebody. Yeah. So it it uh, so Elasticsearch is a document store, uh, and it does not support SQL at all. So it does not fit into sort of a traditional reporting tool, uh, you know, kind of a paradigm like you would. Uh, but that's where something like Kibana actually comes in, is it can set that up for you pretty quickly. And it's customizable. You can go in and, and it's more work than having an off-the-shelf tool. <laughs> uh, right. But, you know, if you're an engineer, the fun thing is you can play with it. <laughs> I mean, something like Tableau or ClickView would be the kind of thing. Oh. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't work with Tableau. Or I, some of those tools are trying to go that direction, trying to integrate with, with uh with sort of the NoSQL world, but it's it's a pretty so different world. Line, their SQL identity, right? They're, and that, that's their challenge. And yeah, it doesn't speak SQL, so it's a whole different. To answer that question, I did just that. Oh. We wrote our own API to this. In other words, we wrote our own, we wrote our own API to tell us what information we want to see. Right. Right. And then our application talks to that API. So we wrote our own API to tell us what we want to see. It doesn't necessarily have drag and drop here and there. It has a it has a dashboard we built for yeah. our software specifically. But all the API does is query Elasticsearch and return that data. So no, there's no SQL warning there. It runs Elasticsearch. So yeah, you could write an API that translates to whatever you want. And we have a C sharp front end, and that's a Java API. Yeah, their team did an amazing job, by the way. It's an incredible product. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say too. It, it does seem like the uh, you know the, you have a SQL with a very structured you know here's what you're selecting, here's the where, and, like that. and on the search side you have something that's kind of uh, bleeding into that a little bit, right? Where you the, the more sophisticated your search, you know, you can have like the you know pluses and minuses to uh -huh. do things, and then the faceting is kind of a, a drill down type thing. It seems yeah, like especially cool. aggregations. Yeah, exactly. aggregations are extremely cool. Right. So it seems like I mean it's it's kind of different ways to skin a 
skin a cat, right? You're 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 kind of close to. Yeah, and it's a more efficient way of joining because you don't have to do well, all the process. Right, and like and to your point, it's so much easier. Everybody knows how to search, you know. Yeah. You know, so uh, it's well, it's easy, but search is, you know, everybody. Yeah, it, it is it is different though. It's oh, yeah. it'll give you an answer whether you want one or not. It may not be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you have it takes a little bit. You know, that's one of the tricks. It takes a little bit different way of thinking about it. It's like, why did it tell me this? This is not uh, this is not at all what I want. It's like, well, yeah, but you know, if you look at it this way, it's sort of. <laughs> yeah. Needed that very much. The analytics that he built was all based on the aggregation. Yeah. So there wasn't a lot of, give me this exact piece of data, there was much more analytics than aggregations. And so it scaled very well for that situation. Yeah, yeah, especially sub aggregations and, and sub aggregations. Uh, you know, that's that's a capability that just wasn't there before. And now being able to do that, to be able to do nested, nested kinds of aggregations is, is extremely cool. Um, I guess we can, that's probably it for the meeting part of it. I'll, I'll stick around if anybody wants to talk. But. Yeah, I'd say we're, we can still hang around and talk for a little bit, but otherwise I would say the primary meeting is pretty much over. You want to add anything else? Join us Friday at noon at the Leonardo. We'll talk about more air quality things. Um, there will be some more data sets added in the next few days. Hopefully everybody gets out there and starts using them and playing with them. Like I said, there's no right way, there's no wrong way. If you want to learn something, you want to ask questions. Comment on the Jira tickets. I get every email that you comment on. <laughs> I get an email every time you comment, and I will guarantee you that I'll either respond or I'll find somebody to help out or do something. So feel free to comment on those. The Google groups, Matt watches those. Um, Nick watches those. We watch those very closely. So um, communicate and let us know what you're looking for. Cool. Anything yeah, else? I'm things at 3 30 in the morning. you're right. Jira tickets. I'm going to Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming.